October 9, 1967. Despite his surreptitious execution, the amputating of his hands for fingerprint testing, and his hasty burial next to an airfield runway, there was no hiding him. Che Guevara was to become one of the greatest legends and icons of the 20th century. The moment news of his death broke, the youth took to the streets everywhere, brandishing his portrait, thus setting it on its way to becoming one of the best known and most reproduced images in the world. To better grasp the birth of his legendary status, we need to trace Che step by step through his formative years, which began with his arrival in Cuba as a combat medic for the rebel army led by Fidel Castro. We need to follow him through the corridors of power and the aftermath of a revolution which was the first to be caught entirely on film. And from Beijing to Algiers, New York to Moscow, to understand the reasons why his face became a weapon in the international communication battle at the height of the Cold War. We finally need to analyze for what future and for what ideal Che, in the face of all opposition, sought tirelessly to manufacture his own legendary status, which he meant to survive him. So when and how was the legend of the Guerrero Heroico born? How did socialist theoreticians intend to use his image? And how was Ernesto Guevara finally trapped by this self-same image? In Cuba, everything always begins in the Sierra Maestra. Almost 10 years to the day before Che's death, a reporter covered the guerrilla warfare waged by Fidel Castro and a handful of revolutionaries against the dictatorial regime of Fulgencio Batista. The reporter wanted to hear the combatants' point of view. One of them caught his attention short-haired, an olive green cap, youthful looks, and a camera dangling from a strap. He didn't yet have the looks that would one day make him famous, but he was 29, a trainee doctor, and his brothers in arms were already calling him Che, due to his frequent use of the filler sound Che, in common use among Spanish speakers in Argentina. The report was Che Guevara's media baptism. This archive footage is well known, but people often forget to mention that in this, his first appearance on film, Che decided to introduce himself to the people of Cuba and the world, firstly, by condemning the media. Durante todos los meses, ya son 16 los meses que hemos estado en la Sierra Maestra, han venido periodistas de muchas partes del mundo y se han preocupado de, de la parte, digamos, anecdótica de esta guerra de guerrilla. Hoy aprovecha la oportunidad de la visita de un periodista cubano para dar al, al pueblo de Cuba el primer saludo que tengo oportunidad de dar. The shot is cut here, so we don't have a chance to hear the deep reasoning behind his engagement, nor the guerrilleros overall revolutionary plan. Because the reason Che had chosen to join in this crazy venture was that he knew the dictator, Fulgencio Batista, was head of a puppet government backed by the United States, and that Cuba was only 90 miles away from the coast of Florida and living under America's control.
For 50 years, the Pearl of the Caribbean had been America's playground and garden of delights, but also its main supplier of sugar and, with Guantanamo, one of its strategic military outposts. By fighting guerrilla warfare here, Che Guevara and his Cuban comrades believed not only could they orchestrate the triumph of social revolution on the island, but also by inflicting a first defeat on the imperial power of the United States, paved the way to freedom for all other Latin American countries. In the meantime, Fidel Castro, who had promoted Che Guevara to commander, gave him the task of developing infrastructures which were for guerrilla warfare. Every assignment that was ever given to Che, it was because he was the right person, the best person for that job, uh, and because he had, he had distinguished himself in the fighting and in the, leader, and in the leadership. As the commander of his own force, he had a kind of an autonomous region in the mountains. And, and while he was uh, there, he created many things. It included everything from making boots to uh, uniforms, to a bread oven, uh, farming in, in collaboration with local peasants, but an effort to be truly self-sufficient. And, um, and also he created uh, his own media outlets. In 1958, Che founded Radio Rebelde, breaking Fulgencio Batista's media monopoly with extremely makeshift means. It would become the world's first ever social network. De, de, de l'histoire. Aquí Radio Rebelde transmitiendo desde un punto de la Tierra Maestra en el territorio libre de Cuba. Aquí Radio Rebelde desde la Tierra Maestra, territorio libre de Cuba. Aquí Radio Rebelde. He seemed to be aware that at the very beginning the medium was the message and you needed to own it if you could. Call it a propaganda arm, call it a media arm. You needed to inform and involve people. You couldn't just remain hermetic. This was always important from the very beginning. The role of Radio Rebelde would prove vital in the final stages of the struggle. Over the airways, on January 1st, 1959, Fidel Castro launched an appeal for a general strike and proclaimed the triumph of the revolution. In the eyes of the Cuban people, Fidel was the figurehead of the insurgency. Far from the shimmering image he would later develop, for now, Che remained firmly in the shadows. And even though he appeared before the flashbulbs and cameras of reporters now flocking around the rebel army, with all the distinctive symbols of the guerrero in popular myth, the combat fatigues, cigar, black beret, sparse beard, and hair, his face was practically unknown. When the guerrieros entered Havana, very few people knew Che Guevara. Very few at all. At the beginning of 1959, people in Havana and beyond were, were wondering exactly who this man was, Che, and, and what, he was, what he meant, what his inclusion in the rebel ranks meant. It was the first time he had set foot in the capital. That doesn't sound like a big deal, but it was, because he was in the front line of the revolution, and he had absolutely no idea of the situation he was about to be confronted with. Indeed, the situation in Havana was far removed from the Cuba he had been introduced to up in the hills. Havana was a match for the capital city of any developed country. Yes, racial segregation was still rife and prostitution was a mass industry. The most disadvantaged were living in extreme poverty and thousands of children lived on the streets. But while electricity was absent over the best part of the island, the capital's infrastructures were among the most modern in the New World. The middle class enjoyed an entire telephone network. There was an opera house, a number of theaters, and dozens of movie theaters. And moreover, there was one of the most highly developed audiovisual setups in Latin America. 
In this megalopolis of over one million inhabitants, almost every home had a TV set. It was in this city, which Che entered in the revolutionary front line, that change would have to begin. There was this idea of revolutionary everything, you know, in which also the media had, a, had a, uh, uh, an important part. He was of the opinion that the revolution needed its own media unmitigated by corporate or Western or bourgeois interests. It wasn't down to chance that the first measure taken by the fledgling revolution was the founding of ICAIC, the Cuban Institute of Cinematographic Art and Industry, which produced its famous noticieros, which were shown before movies in the island nation's movie theaters. But we know little about the direct part that Che Guevara played in the reorganization of the rest of the Cuban mass media. A mere two weeks after revolution was proclaimed, he founded Prensa Latina, the new Cuban press agency, which was meant to rival the major US news networks and spread the revolutionary message throughout the world. But that wasn't all. Since entering Havana, the eyes of Che Guevara and the other leaders of the revolution were fixed on the vast Cuban TV network which would bring them into every living room. And even before the nationalization process was complete, they renamed the channels. After Radio Rebel, there was now Revolucion TV. He and Fidel come on the world stage at the very beginning of the television age, and uh, they were very aware that television was the new medium, and it had a, a power that was transformative. Oh, si no! Radio, press, TV. Equipped with this firepower, the Cuban Revolution could now engage the American enemy in its first battle, a battle of communication. Because the first assaults were launched in the media and concerned Che Guevara's new post, that of chief prosecutor and commander of La Cabana prison, where he would oversee the establishing of the Revolutionary Court. Che's job was arguably the more important one. It was to secure the revolution in what became the hard line side of the new Cuban revolutionary face, which were the, sh the trials, uh, court martials, and in some cases, executions of war criminals. He was perhaps seen as tough and rigid, but most importantly, he acted in a very ethical way. And that's what was expected of him. Because remember, at the time, the whole of Cuban society was baying for justice. We must also remember that the brutality and corruption within the U.S.-backed Batista regime, imposed on the Cuban population for years, had left very deep scars. Accompanied by cameramen, investigators discovered the instruments of torture used in the jails of the old regime and revealed the terrible crimes committed by the dictatorship. Implements of torture are put into evidence, tools to tear back the fingernails and perform even more brutal forms of torture. Some cannot be shown. It was a fierce, bloody dictatorship, which lasted from 1952 to 1959 and cost the lives of 20,000 people. At that time, crimes committed by the police and the army went unpunished, and it wasn't exceptional to find the bodies of assassinated young people lying by the roadside. So revolutionary justice set out to be implacable with the men guilty of those crimes. In the military fortress overlooking Havana Harbor, almost 2,000 people were imprisoned in front of the camera lenses. Che Guevara set up revolutionary tribunals on a similar basis to those established after World War II. The death sentences began to mount up, like for Cornelio Rojas, the former chief of the Santa Clara police. The footage shown on TV was meant to shock. Rumors began to circulate. The foreign press set alarm bells ringing and denounced the thousands of summary trials and executions. The US Congress demanded an inquiry. Before the media, Che Guevara suddenly changed from being the prosecutor to the accused. 
people talked about thousands killed and innocence and that he was a sadist and a torturer. None of that's true. Contrary to what has been said, there was no bloodbath with hundreds of people executed every day. It's true that some trials were summary and drew people's attention because of that. But summary trials resulting in death sentences have always raised a lot of eyebrows. It was used by the imperialist powers to attack the revolution, of course, and to put it in the worst light uh, that these are just uh, you know, arbitrary executions. Uh, which they were, it was the opposite. As a response to disinformation, the revolutionary press published photos of the victims of Batista's regime and a full list of the names of 200 people sentenced to death. But criticism still intensified. So Fidel Castro decided to call for a mass rally at which he could defy the US media in front of the international press. In Cuba, this media war was given the codename Operación Verdad, Operation Truth, to prove to the Cuban people and to the world that the trials respected all rights to legal defense and that the accused were genuinely guilty. Fidel Castro asked Che Guevara to organize, on a single day, January 22, 1959, a long series of trials. C'est sur la piste du Palais des Sports devant 17,000 Cubains que se déroule au milieu d'une ambiance extraordinaire le premier de ces procès. Prensa Latina and Revolucion TV had their part to play as well by covering the event and broadcasting it to over 400 reporters from all over the world. Séance dramatique au cours de laquelle l'audition des témoins atteint parfois au tragique. Voici parmi eux un enfant de 12 ans. Il désigne l'accusé. Il a tué mon père. La foule hurle, tuez-le. Quelques heures plus tard, Blanco était exécuté. But there was further controversy when the Cuban revolutionaries were accused of holding showcase trials like those which had been staged in Moscow. For Westerners coming from the United States or perhaps Europe, this looked like famous show trials or kangaroo courts with a, a Roman circus, you know, with crowds yelling at the condemned and so on. The first battle in the media war was lost. The name of Che Guevara was more widely known, but he had been given a new nickname by counter-revolutionaries, the Butcher of La Cabana. Fidel Castro suspended the trials. Che wanted to continue. Uh, Fidel felt that the political capital was too great in continuing, and he stopped it. Fidel Castro appointed Che Guevara to a post less in the media spotlight, but just as important in the revolutionary process, president of the National Bank of Cuba. A strange appointment, that of a guerrero, medic, heading a banking and financial institution. His first symbolic actions may have raised a smile, but they did allow him to be viewed in a more favorable light. He signed the, the Cuban banknotes from that point on with just Che. <laughs> I think it was a way of uh, expressing his contempt for money. <laughs> Some saw in this a form of contempt for money, but everyone already knew him by the name of Che. That's what Cubans called him. And Che wasn't Ernesto Guevara de la Serna. He was Che. So maybe he had simply decided to adopt what had been his war name as his civilian name in Cuba, Che. Talking about his own role as the president of the bank, he said, I'm more of a guerrero than a bank president. So he acted like a guerrero, blow by blow, attempting to defeat the enemy. And the enemy, first and foremost, was imperialism. At the time, the National Bank was a super ministry, a financial super department. It was not only in charge of issuing currency, but also of cash flow, international transfers, control of the country's resources, overseed purchases and import permits. 
It remained a bank. It was technically a national department that took all the major decisions regarding the Cuban economy. So Che held a crucial position. This central role cast him into the spotlight. And although Che still seemed to remain in Castro's shadow at the signature for the nationalization of U.S. banks, it was he who became the star of news reports when, to avert the first economic retaliation measures established by the United States, agreements with the major socialist powers were concluded. The banker who smoked a banker's cigar but dressed in combat fatigues bemused his counterparts and the foreign press. But Che Guevara was still not a national hero. Nobody brandished his picture on May 1st, 1960, out on Revolution Square. And although personality cults did not exist in Cuba, people preferred to sculpt homemade busts of Jose Marti, the so-called apostle of Cuban independence, and wear the portrait of Camilo Cienfuegos, he too a commander of the revolution, or more rarely, and not always overflattering, that of Fidel Castro. No trace of the famous portrait of Che on this wall. And yet, on this Labor Day march, the photo which is so famous today had already been taken many months before. The French freighter, La Courbe, explodes in Havana Harbor. This uh, ship had been towed in to one of the docks uh, in Old Havana, just behind Old Havana in the bay, and it blew up. There was two explosions. Over 100 people were killed. Uh, nobody really knows how many. They were vaporized. The Cuban authorities immediately suspected the CIA. Because since the beginning, the United States had been waging more than a mere media war on the revolution. Immediately in 1959, the US launched a clandestine war, a clandestine paramilitary war against Cuba. Not a day went by without some armed group organized and financed by the CIA setting off a bomb or derailing a train. The CIA station in Miami was the biggest in the world of all of its so-called stations with hundreds of employees. And in the days when Cuba you, it was still accessible, you could come and go, both from the United States and from the, and from the rest of the Americas, they infiltrated people. The Cuban TV headquarters and those of ICAIC, the Cuban Cinematographic Institute, were close by. Their cameramen were among the first to arrive on the scene, and their footage, in which we can see Che Guevara, also quickly present, were seen all over the world. This was a huge event. And um, the next day, Che, Fidel, Raul, Sartre, and uh, Simon de Beauvoir, who were in Havana, also joined this, this march, marched down the avenue near the dock, joining hands, and were photographed doing this. And then there was a moment when they stopped and on a, on a stage uh, spoke to the crowds that had gathered. Among the photographers present on the corner of 12th and 23rd Streets in the Vedato district, where a stage had been set up for Fidel Castro to make a speech, Alberto Diaz Gutierrez, also known as the photographer Corda, was working on a report for the Cuban newspaper Revolucion. Corda era un grandissimo photographer. Corder was a fantastic photographer who had started out in advertising. He was taking some photos of the stage, and he said that all of a sudden, and these are his own words, he sensed the image of Che suddenly enter his lens. He had a reflex reaction and took the picture. He felt a kind of chill and he froze. The picture he took is this incredible, famous image of Che looking as if into history itself, this look of the implacable re revolutionary. 
seeing beyond the present, almost. It's a totally hieratic image. You can see power, energy, and determination, but at the same time, great physical beauty. It's as if it were some kind of prophetical announcement. Revolution. You can see revolution and revolutionary romanticism. That's what you see in it. This photo, which Corda entitled Guerrero Heroico, the heroic guerrilla fighter, didn't become famous immediately. It was too out of focus, and Revolution preferred those of Jean-Paul Sartre or Simone de Beauvoir, who were much more famous than Che at the time. But contrary to the long-standing urban myth, the photo wasn't just gathering dust in a drawer for years. Without anyone really noticing, it appeared several times in its definitive format. Like here, in the bottom corner of a page of Revolución, to announce a public conference to be given by Che. And yet, it was a time when Che himself was emerging more and more. But that was less due to this photo than to the covers of Western magazines, which were the first to focus on him. French photographers like Henri Cartier-Bresson, but also visiting American reporters who were struck by his handsome good looks and charisma. He was dramatically handsome. You couldn't take your eyes off when he was in front of you. He had this kind of charisma and an intensity that went with his physical look that was very powerful to people. Between ads and fashion reports, portraits of Che began to adorn the inside pages of U.S. weeklies. But because Fidel Castro was still popular in much of the United States and seemed relatively moderate, since the Cuban Revolution was yet to be declared socialist, the conservative propaganda machine turned their attention to Che to stir up fears of red peril during this period of Cold War. The prestigious Time magazine, no less, gave him the front cover and called him the brain of the revolution. And dozens of documentaries were made to denounce his almost Mephistopheles-like influence. Ernesto che Guevara. Che Guevara has now worked himself into one of the top spots in the 26th of July movement and exercises a Rasputin-like influence over Castro. He hates the United States. <laughs> That's a very American way of stating things. That expression, the brain of the revolution, would certainly have raised an eyebrow with Che, because it's not a very Marxist viewpoint and shows no understanding of what the revolutionary process is. But it's true that Che, through his theoretical education and his capacity for discipline and study, had become crucial to the political and economic management of the revolution. And in practice, he took on more and more roles, so, like it or not, he became one of the most important figures among the revolutionaries. Denounced in the West as a dangerous Bolshevik at the height of the Cold War, the Eastern Bloc naturally began to show interest in Che Guevara. Especially as, since the 20th Congress of the Communist Party and the denunciation by Khrushchev of the personality cult and its consequences in the Soviet Union, Moscow was seeking new figures to inspire the people. They tried with Raul Castro, who very early on had visited the USSR and had on his side the fact of being Fidel's brother. But you've got to admit, he did lack a bit of charisma. So the Soviets were very keen to meet this new figure from Cuba. During his trip, all the stops were pulled out. He was put on view and filmed, and a number of reports were dedicated to him. And the seduction was reciprocal. The Soviet Union wanted to take ownership of the Cuban Revolution, and their treatment of Che was a way of giving Che, and Cuba as a whole, the illusion that the global fatherland of socialism was also the fatherland of Cuban socialism. This exposure turned Che Guevara into a leading figure in the socialist camp and in third world countries. He made visit after visit to Indonesia, to China, where he met Mao, and to North Korea, where he was given a state reception by Kim Il-sung. Then a little later to Algeria, 
where Cuba, and especially Che Guevara, supported the National Liberation Front, and where the recently independent people welcomed him as one of their own. Vive la République Angélienne, démocratique et populaire, et son gouvernement The fact that he was non-Cuban, although he had been made a Cuban, was also something that was, I think, uh, uh, very appealing, uh, because it showed that Cuba was capable of transcending nationality, that it really was a, a crucible of internationalist solidarity. He, 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 he sort of ticked that box. <laughs> But it was back in Cuba that Che Guevara, who in the meantime had been appointed Minister of Industries, had grown extremely popular. Not because he had toured the world, and not because he had played an important role in humiliating the United States in April 1961 during the failed invasion at the Bay of Pigs. He didn't even stand out during the Cuban Missile Crisis of October 1962. In these last two events, it was always Fidel Castro who remained firmly in the spotlight. The reason he became a major figure is because on the island, he was at the very center of an economic debate which filled all press and TV news space, and which had evolved into a battle between the upholders of hardline Stalinism, known more discreetly as Orthodox Communists, and the new Minister of Industry. There hadn't been a debate like that one in a revolutionary process for 20 years, when Lenin was still around. The debate went public. It was in magazines and so on. And everyone defended their stance, with mutual respect, of course, but it was all very controversial. To grasp the complexities of the debate and understand how it brought Che Guevara to the front of the stage, we must remember that it was a critical period. The United States backed up its military aggression against the island with tough economic measures. One of the longest and toughest embargoes in history had just been imposed. Shortages soon began to be felt. Manufacturing companies were hit hard as they no longer had raw materials to convert into products. And for the population, ration books were introduced to guarantee a minimum level of subsistence. The effect on the morale of part of the population, worn out by three years of revolution, was catastrophic. Absenteeism increased in factories, and bureaucracy slowly paralyzed business. Cuba was caught in a vicious cycle. So within this context, the question facing the Minister of Industries now was how to convince the population to pursue its efforts. The question was whether to apply the management methods of the Soviet Union, which, since the day of Stakhanovism, was based on the notion of convincing workers to work more so as to earn more. But that creates competition between workers and also a segment of workers with more privileges than others. And Guevara rejected that. He promoted the idea of um, moral incentives as opposed to material incentives as the trigger for new socialist man and for the correct way forward for the Cuban revolution. He had to develop revolutionary consciousness among the people. Altruism had to overcome individualism. Solidarity had to replace selfishness. The satisfaction of fulfilled duty or moral reward had to become more important than material reward. Because for Che, the stakes of this debate were much higher than finding a solution to a more or less transitory economic crisis. Cuba needed to give birth to the new man who alone, once rid of all individualism and capitalism, would be able to forge true communism. So he started making more speeches and stepped up his TV appearances. 
para todos los que en el, en el frente del trabajo han demostrado su espíritu de sacrificio, su espíritu comunista, su nueva actitud frente a la vida, debe valer siempre la frase de Fidel que ustedes insertaron en uno de los palcos de este recinto. Los que fuimos en las horas de mortal peligro, sepamos serlo también en la producción. Sepamos ser trabajadores de patria o muerte. But in order to convince the people his ideas were fair, rather than debate endlessly and launch bold appeals, Che Guevara decided to put his ideas into practice and lead by example. Always from the very beginning as a leader, he felt that, well, he led by example, by doing what he, he never asked anyone else to do something that he thought he, he could not do. To be demanding of the people, and Che was always very demanding of the Cubans, asking them to work hard, to study hard, to be ready to defend their homeland. To be demanding, you must have moral authority and necessary legitimacy. And you can only acquire that by preaching with an example. The true school for Che's new man was notably unpaid voluntary work, done in one's spare time, on top of one's daily quota of work and other tasks, and Che Guevara led the way. And as images are worth much more than long speeches, he let the cameras come to him. El comandante Ernesto Guevara, ministro de Industrias, se destaca en el trabajo voluntario, en el que participan 1.500 trabajadores que han producido 40.450 metros de telas en 9.090 horas, además de la labor de reparación de los telares y limpieza de las máquinas. And that's how, for two long years, screens were filled with footage of a minister who earned the salary of a secretary with no extra perks and who, even on weekends, set the example by cutting sugar cane, building walls or weaving fabrics as he strove to embody his new man for real. He didn't pose exactly, but he, he also allowed photographers to follow him. He was aware that this aspect of the revolution was key. If he was to be seen to be uh, fulfilling the tasks that he urged others to do, if he was calling upon people to give up their time and their lives on behalf of the revolution, he had to be shown to be doing it. There was no vanity here, no posing. These images didn't set out to create a new idol, to build a personality cult, or to act as communication, as we now call low-intensity propaganda. The Minister of Industries participated in the efforts of the people, and it was no play act, because when the camera stopped rolling, Che kept on working. Che showed up in Havana Harbor and started giving a hand to unload a cargo ship. All the Cubans around him were convinced he'd help out for a few minutes and then be on his way. But what a surprise they had when he stayed there for several hours and didn't leave until the last sack was unloaded. But in Cuba, some people's backs were starting to get up. Bureaucrats felt they were being singled out, and certain leaders, who benefited from privileges, felt they were suffering in Che's shadow. Nobody says so today, but in fact, there was a lot of resentment of Che for this. And in the end, Fidel is the one who ended this debate in favor of material incentives. And that effectively ended also Che's uh, healthy debate with the Orthodox Communists in Cuba over the way to go forward. Although Che Guevara had lost the battle of the economy, he had clearly won the battle of the media, and his image shone forth. 
When, in late 1964, Cuba was called on to address the new General Assembly of the United Nations, it was only natural that Fidel Castro should dispatch Che to New York. And his speech, broadcast live around the world, gave the general public the chance to discover a man who, on his own, appeared to embody the Cuban Revolution. Che, in olive green battle dress, stepped up onto the rostrum and launched into a scathing indictment of the United States and its imperialistic ways. It was a kind of paean, a hymn to the independence of the Third World. Que día a día nuestras masas proclaman como expresión irrefutable de su decisión de lucha, paralizando la mano armada del invasor. Proclama que cuenta con la comprensión y el apoyo de todos los pueblos del mundo. Esa proclama es patria o muerte. He spoke in a, in a way with passionate conviction and he had a, a very powerful media presence and public presence. This was probably his moment of maximum public exposure in, in the international public eye. He was at the apogee of, of his public authority. Che changed overnight. He was not only a great revolutionary leader, but now a genuine global leader. Because in the mid-1960s, the world was in turmoil. Throughout Latin America, revolt was brewing. In Africa, almost 20 countries had finally freed themselves from the yoke of colonialism. And in Southeast Asia, Viet Cong fighters were putting up heroic resistance to the U.S. Army. In face of all this, the Soviet Union, which had opted for detente, left the revolutionaries to their own devices. Cuba, which since the early days of the revolution had given technological and military support to peoples involved in armed struggles, notably due to Che, became more and more solicited. That was the reason why, after his speech at the UN, Che embarked on a new series of visits across the globe, only this time to fledgling states like those in Africa, where, early in 1965, he visited almost a dozen countries. He wanted uh, the new socialist man to emerge from this extraordinary moment in which so many countries were, were being born and a new kind of socialism was possible. But just as he had become known to people everywhere, could finally speak to the media on behalf of peoples involved in struggles, and put forward his own ideas on the international stage, like here in Algiers, his last public appearance, of which this is the only existing footage, all trace of him was suddenly lost. Che disappears from the world stage, suddenly. Here he is, a minister in this revolutionary government. He's been on the world stage. He's met with the world's leaders. He's called for action in Africa, Asia, Latin America. He's associated with guerrilla struggles around the world. And he suddenly disappears. It has often been said that the Soviet Union, which he had accused of being an imperialistic power just like any other, was behind his eviction from the leadership of the Cuban Revolution. It was also suggested, although it's now known to be untrue, that a heated 40-hour argument with Fidel Castro had led to his hasty departure. In fact, we know very little. The one thing we are sure of is that for a long time, and especially once he believed the Cuban Revolution to be well consolidated, Che Guevara wanted to take up real arms again and continue the armed struggle against American imperialism. It was coming, the desire to get to the battlefield again, to, to get back to that experience that, of maximum idealism that he'd lived in the Sierra, where each day he was living the ideal. And in fact, 
is what makes guerrilla warfare for someone who thinks of themselves as a revolutionary an absolutely unparalleled experience because outside of the battlefield you have to compromise. You have to compromise with others who don't agree with you. Uh, adversaries far and near. And, and this was what he was trying to get back to. Just as he did on Sundays with volunteer labor, go back to the battlefield, go to the front, live by example. And with the mystery now surrounding his whereabouts, Che was gradually turning into a legend. While in previous battles, his image was used as a weapon, his absence had now seemingly become an even bigger threat. His portrait, snapped by Corda the day after the La Courbe explosion, was no longer representing a man, but a phantom. And Fidel Castro and the revolutionary leadership used it to his advantage. It was seen everywhere during the massive Tricontinental Conference in 1966, which drew together all the revolutionary movements of the Third World. His nickname was on everyone's lips. Los pueblos de América Latina cuentan con la experiencia, la capacidad y el talento de un hombre que se ha convertido en una de las más grandes pesadillas del imperialismo. El comandante Ernesto Che Guevara. They, everybody knew he was somewhere fighting, and of course, spy agencies are looking for him. Whenever he showed up, he set alarm bells ringing among the World Secret Services. All of them wanted to know what he was up to. The reason he was so hard to track down was because his own image had become his main source of danger. So to avoid detection, Che needed to become anonymous again. First of all, in the Congo, where he had to keep a low profile. He was even forbidden from going to the front for fear that the color of his skin would betray his identity to the authorities. And then, when he arrived in Bolivia, a small country compared to its neighbors, but where, thanks to its five borders, a revolutionary triumph could cause the whole of Latin America to definitively topple, he had to abandon his typical appearance, drop his nickname, and even change his face. Che's face was well known across the globe due to his media exposure. So for safety's sake, he had to disguise himself. And he came up with a new look so nobody would recognize him. He went through incredibly complex disguise procedures. He had his teeth completely changed. He had his hair pulled out strand by strand so it wouldn't grow back too fast. It must have been painful, very painful. Before the amused eyes of Fidel Castro, the Cuban Secret Service, which Che had helped to found, transformed him. A suit and necktie, thick glasses, thinning white hair. The familiar face of the Argentinian revolutionary was replaced by that of a mundane, down-to-earth Uruguayan businessman called Ramon Benitez. But despite the talent of the Cuban makeup artists, his disguise finally wore thin. For after several months of guerrilla warfare up in the Bolivian mountains, Che Guevara had returned to normal and word began to spread about him. It was a newspaper which first hinted at his presence and drew the attention of the Bolivian authorities and the CIA. The US trained Bolivian special force was sent to track him down. After a battle in which 2,000 men attacked the remaining handful of guerrilleros still fit enough to fight, and despite their fierce resistance, Che Guevara was arrested. Taken to the village of La Higuera, a last photo of him alive was taken. His capturers posed at his side, and then, on October 9, 1967, the day after his arrest, he was executed. His belongings were shared out, his body was put on display in a hospital laundry house, and the press was summoned to immortalize the event. Then, in a twist of fate, when his hands were amputated for fingerprint testing by the CIA, they were sent wrapped in a copy of that day's newspaper.
He was a trophy, a formidable victory for the Bolivian army, a military victory, and a political victory for Washington. They needed proof of death to exhibit to the world, and thus they hoped to dampen the dream, to uh, give proof of his failure and of this idea that he had represented. These photos were seen worldwide. They prompted Fidel Castro to officially announce Che's death and the defeat of the Guerrero Heroico live on Cuban TV. And yet... Paradoxically, the filming of his body and the nature of the way he was displayed and his actual physical look uh, was transcendent for his legacy, not for them. He became a symbol of, of revolutionary struggle all over the world. Uh, and that was true in the United States. As I said, it was, it was true in France. It was true, it was true everywhere. Because to erase the image of Che Guevara lying dead from the memory, the rebellious youth of 1968 chose to brandish the portrait of the guerrero heroico. And so it is that despite his surreptitious execution, the amputating of his hands for fingerprint testing, and his hasty burial next to an airfield runway, Che Guevara has become one of the greatest legends and icons of the 20th century. Because he continues to represent the very example of the complete revolutionary, ready to make every sacrifice to build a world of fairness and solidarity, an archetypal figure whom, for a while, capitalism thought it could accommodate, but who remains the living portrait, not of revolt, but of revolution. Ahora sí, la historia tendrá que contar con los pobres de América, con los explotados y vilipendiados de América Latina, que han decidido empezar a escribir ellos mismos para siempre su historia. Ya se les ve por los caminos un día y otro, a pie en marcha sin término de cientos de kilómetros, para llegar hasta los Olimpos gobernantes a recabar sus derechos. Porque esta gran humanidad ha dicho basta y ha echado a andar. Y su marcha de gigantes ya no se detendrá hasta conquistar la verdadera independencia por la que ya han muerto más de una vez inútilmente.